Okay, to uh, continue our, our talks for this afternoon, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Joe Brewer. Uh, he's from Kansas City, so we can't hold that against him. <laughs> um, and I met him, it's been about two years now, or maybe about a year, year, yeah. year ago. Uh, my, how time flies. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's with St. Luke's in Kansas City, as well as you hold an appointment an academic appointment with the University of Missouri in Kansas City. And uh, it's a real pleasure to work with him. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work in Lyme's and chronic disease, and, and uh, we're very appreciative that he takes the time to come and talk to us. So Joe, without any further. Thank you, Dennis. The, um... And I also would like to thank all the other speakers, including the lunch speakers who have gone before me because they laid a nice groundwork for, uh, for what I'm going to say. Um, the topic, my topic is, is mycotoxins and chronic illness. And um, the, uh, I'll start out with uh, a sort of a discussion of, of chronic illness. The, uh, um, this other could be a huge category. This could be a lot of the iceberg that's under the water. Um, uh, but when I first kind of got started in this, uh, the prototype was chronic fatigue syndrome, which as many of you know in uh, Europe is called myalgic encephalitis. Uh, fibromyalgia, which is off, very often present with chronic fatigue syndrome. Chronic Lyme disease, uh, there's a tremendous amount of overlap in symptoms, a Gulf War syndrome that was mentioned earlier, multiple chemical sensitivity, and again there's this big other uh, uh, category. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to use the word chronic fatigue syndrome or the term uh, chronic fatigue syndrome as the prototype, even though, again, there's a tremendous amount of overlap uh, in all of these uh, <coughs> conditions. The um, uh, for the data that I'll be presenting today from the study that we've done, um, we uh, have used the uh, so-called Fukuda definition for chronic fatigue syndrome. This was published by, by a group at CDC um, in 1994. Um, and basically the definition is that one has to rule out other uh, causes of unexplained chronic fatigue. Uh, this is done simply with a history and physical mental status exam and uh, usually some uh, routine screening laboratory test, uh, CBC, chemistry panel, urinalysis, thyroid. Um, the fatigue for the Fukuda definition needs to last greater than six months. Uh, so uh, it is new or persistent fatigue to last greater than six months. And then they need to have four or more of the following, which is impaired memory or concentration, sore throat, tender cervical or axillary lymph nodes, muscle pain, muscle, uh, I'm sorry, multi-joint pain, new onset headaches, unrefreshing sleep, and post-exertion malaise. Uh, so if they have four of those, you've ruled out other things, and it's lasted longer than six months, that would meet the uh, Fukuda definition. Now this was not meant for clinical purposes. This definition was meant for epidemiological purposes to take these people who had these chronic complaints and, uh, and study them uh, for epidemiological purposes. But uh, as usually happens in medicine, then this starts getting used um, uh, clinically. Now, the, um, <clears throat> um, how I got involved with, with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is up here at the top. Uh, because there are many proposed uh, etiologic associations. This is just a parcel list, uh, but I've kind of grouped them into infection, toxic exposures, and then immune dysregulation for whatever reason. Um, so uh, well over 25 years ago, um, uh, I became interested. I was working with quite a few HIV patients at that time. That was uh, um, a new uh, descriptive illness that... Uh, uh, came our way in 1981. HIV was discovered in 1985. And so at about the mid-80s, there was a discussion of this uh, chronic fatiguing illness. Now, this, this kind of an illness has been described in the literature uh, going back well over 100 years. Um, but 
there was a discussion that, that there may be a viral etiology. And the first virus that was, that was uh, suspected during the decade of the 80s was Epstein-Barr virus. So I started getting these people referred to me because there had been a paper published that uh, uh, people with this, these chronic fatiguing illnesses had very high EBV serology panels. And they'd have very high IgG titers, occasionally a positive IgM. And so these people would get referred to me. And I'd already had background with this, with this HIV virus, which was devastating uh, to the patients. And so uh, I began to see some parallels between what we would see with this HIV virus and Epstein-Barr virus uh, in these patients. And so uh, we've gone down, uh, not just me, but many people have gone down many different uh, avenues for infection, uh, HHV6, Q fever, which uh, can cause a uh, syndrome, particularly in Australia, that looks identical to chronic fatigue syndrome, enteroviruses, parvovirus, Lyme disease, particularly chronic Lyme disease, mycoplasma, chlamydia, et cetera, et cetera. So there have been a lot of infectious associations which drew me uh, into this area. Again, toxic exposures, which we'll talk about today. And, uh, and then uh, there's a lot of features of chronic fatigue syndrome um, that have sort of an autoimmune uh, sense to it. Okay, um, so with chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, there have been a number of basic science and clinical associations that have, that have surfaced over the last uh, 20 to 30 years uh, since it's been studied. Uh, remember the, the name chronic fatigue syndrome it was actually first coined in 1988 by a uh, committee set up by CDC and then in 1994 Fukuda and that group revised the definition to what is still currently used for epidemiology purposes. So these patients uh, appear to uh, frequently have immune dysregulation um, uh, and similar to what was uh, described this morning is the immune, si immune system can be up, down, or both simultaneously. So they uh, have been clearly shown to have abnormal cytokine release. They have uh, a lot of inflammatory parameters, autoimmune features. But uh, many of these patients also have ed evidence of immune deficiency. Um, they have numerous neurologic and neurocognitive abnormalities, uh, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, autonomic nervous system, including neuropsychiatric and neurocognitive problems, which is extremely common in these patients. Endocrine abnormalities uh, can really run the entire gamut, especially the uh, hypothalamic pituitary uh, axis, adrenal axis, but also they have thyroid abnormalities, sex hormone abnormalities. They have a lot of psychiatric and behavioral um, uh, complaints. Uh, excellent data that these people are under uh, fairly substantial oxidative stress. They have increased free radicals and uh, simultaneously they have uh, impairment of antioxidant function. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this today is mitochondrial dysfunction, which has been shown, I'll show you on later slides, has uh, been, been shown both in vitro and in uh, uh, clinical studies. So, why consider mycotoxins? Well, uh, when I found out about uh, real-time laboratories and that there was a way to actually measure mycotoxins, and I did my homework, I thought, well, is their test any good? Uh, how accurate is it? Has it been validated, et cetera? Uh, I became uh, very interested in, in this particular phenomenon. Now, I am different than most of the other people because I am a traditional infectious diseases specialist. So. My background with mold is treating, uh, as I have a patient right now, treating a heart transplant patient uh, who has pulmonary aspergillosis uh, and is on, going to be on, a, on antifungal medications for six to 12 months, and if we don't do that, he will die of disseminated aspergillosis. So most of my background with fungal uh, infections has been in the immunocompromised host, uh, uh, cancer patients, transplant patients, et cetera. Uh, so I'm a newcomer to the mycotoxin arena. I've read about them before, I've known about them, but I'm a relatively relative newcomer. The other thing is you'll see in the data I'm going to present is I've gone about this backwards, okay? Most people who've studied the mycotoxin are environmental people. The patient comes in and they've had an exposure and they're concerned. What, how I went about it is I took, I have this, this 
as you'll see in a few slides, I have this plethora of chronically ill patients, and I ask the question, is there a possibility that this is mycotoxin illness? So I'm starting with a patient who is sick and said, I have all these symptoms, and then I went backwards and asked the uh, questions and tested them. The data I'll think, I think you'll find is quite interesting. So why would we consider mycotoxins? Well, the clinical features of known mycotoxin exposure and chronic fatigue syndrome are actually quite similar. There's, there's been at least one study uh, by Chester and Levine in 1994 uh, in which uh, sick building syndrome led to chronic fatigue syndrome. That's the title of the paper. Uh, mycotoxins are associated with numerous neurologic abnormalities. They can lead to endocrine abnormalities. They can lead to immune dysregulation. They can clearly lead to oxidative stress, free radical generation, and impaired antioxidant function, and they can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. So that is an almost identical list to what I just listed for chronic fatigue syndrome. All of these things, mycotoxins can do all of those things. So it seemed like a pretty natural fit, but how do you test for them? So real-time laboratories came along, and, we did, and so I started down this pathway. Okay, I'm going to take the next few, few slides. You're the first group to have seen this data. No one has seen this data except uh, Drs. Thrasher, Strauss, myself, and Dr. Hooper. These are my patients. Obviously, Dr. Hooper's lab did the testing, and many thanks to Dr. Thrasher and Dr. Strauss for helping us milk this data and uh, analyze all of it and uh, prepare for publication of which we're uh, pr proceeding to publish this. So this is a study we carried out we started about a year ago uh, in uh, testing patients. Uh, we, and so this is a six-month study that ran from, um, uh, for this data set, ran from February 1, 12 through July 31, 2012. Uh, in my practice, uh, I screened, and screening meant that I discussed with the patients uh, this concept uh, uh, for this group. Uh, this number's now up to probably close to 500, but uh, about 300 uh, patients. And we assessed their history of exposure to at least a damp building or water damaged building and potential for mold exposure. And then we discussed with them the uh, real-time laboratory test uh, that, that would uh, look at the uh, urine mycotoxins, which you've already heard about today. So the group of patients uh, the, uh, that we ended up with all the, we, we took the uh, 300, and as you'll see in the next slide, we ended up with 112, uh, all met the Fukuda definition for chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, there are symptoms you've already heard today. It's, a, it's an array of symptoms, and this is, believe me, just a, a very, very partial list. Uh, uh, fatigue, poor exercise tolerance, post-exertional malaise, myalgias, arthralgias, headaches, cognitive complaints, um, numerous neuropsychiatric complaints, uh, Lots of GI problems, lots of neurological problems, uh, uh, similar to what I, I have. There are probably two or three patients in this group that have an, an odd myoclonus, like Dr. Gray described at lunch, autonomic issues, psychological, etc. cetera. Uh, their physical exam was virtually always normal, which would meet the Fukuda definition. Laboratory studies were virtually, routine laboratory studies were virtually always normal. Uh, and then um, the, uh, these patients had had a potpourri of, ur of uh, immunologic testing, either by me or some other doctor that had seen them and referred them. Uh, uh, but there's no, con uh, these patients didn't all get the same immune panel. But the, the one that did stand out most in the uh, analysis of their immunologic testing was diminished natural killer cell activity, which has been widely described and recurrently described with chronic fatigue syndrome. And in fact, that is the most common immunologic feature of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. So these patients actually uh, fit in that one. We did have, there's a fair number of patients in, in this uh, cohort that had hypogammaglobulinemia um, with recurring in, uh, infections, sin sinus infections, bronchitis, pneumonia, et cetera. Uh, you, their T cell activity, et cetera, if and when it was uh, looked at was usually uh, normal on the standard testing. Okay, so here's the group. Um, the, um, uh, of the patients that were screened, we had 112 that met the Fukuda uh, chronic fatigue syndrome criteria. Uh, 
and that agreed to have the urine mycotoxin assay done. Uh, in this group, and this is what I say going about it backwards, I then, when we discussed all of this, I interviewed them, and I've gotten better at these interviews as time has gone on, about uh, potential for mold exposure, starting out with exposure to damp building or water damage building. Uh, so did, did they recall an exposure uh, to some type of a environment and indeed uh, greater than 90 percent had such a history. Now sometimes you had to dig a little bit, sometimes the history, the, the very first lady that came up just rolled her eyes and she says, well I'm sure this applies to me. And I said, well, and she was a Lyme disease patient that I'd followed. And I said, well, why do you think this applies to you? And she said, well, uh, we live in the same house that we've lived in for 20 years. Every time we get a heavy rain, we have cracks in our basement and it floods and we get mold down there and we clean it up ourselves. We've never had any professional help. We clean it up ourselves. We don't wear gloves. We don't wear masks. We just, my husband and I clean it up. And uh, that was the very first patient. Uh, and indeed she tested uh, mycotoxin positive. Um, so the vast majority, now the interesting thing about these histories is it's, many of them go back many years. Some of these p people had their, their most obvious and serious exposure 20, 25, 30 years ago. And um, uh, some of them have pretty good evidence of ongoing or current exposure. Some of them do not. Some of them live in a brand new house that has been tested before they moved in. And their house is fine, but they feel terrible. The, uh, okay, now to the meat of the matter. Uh, so of these 112 patients, 104 had at least one mycotoxin present in the urine by the real time laboratory assay for a 93% uh, hit rate. Ocrotoxin was the most common at 81%, followed by macrocyclic trichothecenes at 42%, and then aflatoxin was only found at 13%. And this has been consistent. I have over 200 positives now, and it's been consistent uh, that aflatoxin comes in dead last by a pretty far stretch. Uh, Combinations were not infrequently found. The most common, and I'll show this uh, more on a, uh, the uh, next slide, the most common was ocrotoxin and trichothecenes, and then all three toxins were found in 8%. Okay, so here's the breakout. Um, aflatoxin uh, uh, was in 12%, uh, ocrotoxin in 81%, uh, trichothecenes in 42 and then you can see the, uh, the uh, combinations. Now, for those of you who have experience with this assay, there are the ranges and the averages. Um, uh, AFLA uh, had a range of about 1 to 9. Um, uh, OCRA, uh, 2 to 14, but I just got one back since we've done this study of about 35. Um, and I've also had somebody that shattered the record on trichothecenes. I think I've had a 24 or so now on trichothecenes since we've completed the study. But in the, for this study, uh, 0.21 to about 6, and you can see the averages here. So for aflatoxin, average of about 5, ochratoxin average of about 6, and about 0.85 for the uh, uh, trichothecenes. Limits of, of detection for the assay are down here. And then we uh, said, and then we looked at, at uh, Dr. Hooper's, which he presented earlier today, his original control group which were a group of, of relatively healthy non-exposed controls. Uh, obviously, we're, we're not a direct comparison. We're comparing with historic controls that were uh, published in 2009. But as you can see, uh, if we just look at the three toxins, uh, we have our data here, and they had zero out of 55. So fairly impressive. Um, and then we had some interesting, I could give you about six of these, but we had some interesting studies uh, of families. This is one that, um, um, that we've written into the paper. Oh, we actually have two family studies in there. This is a very interesting family study. Uh, so these are basically their current ages. We have a father age 50, a mother age 49, daughter age 19, and a daughter age 16, and they all have a chronic fatigue syndrome uh, type illness. Now. They moved into a new home in the Kansas City area in 1991, a brand new home. They were the first occupants, and uh, within about five months, the father became ill, and he's been ill ever since. Uh, and his uh, uh, illness was initially diagnosed as chronic fatigue syndrome. There was some discussion later on about Lyme disease, uh, 
I followed him for uh, probably about 12 years. And he's better than he used to be, but he's still disabled and uh, still has a lot of chronic symptoms. About three years after moving into the home, the mother became ill and was subsequently diagnosed with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. And then both, of course, when they moved into this home, these two daughters hadn't been born yet. So both daughters were born and raised in this home, and they both subsequently developed illness. Now, the 16-year-old the is very ill. She cannot uh, uh, attend school. Sometimes she cannot even do home study. The 19-year-old is actually the best of the four. She, uh, is, uh, uh, she meets the criteria for chronic pig syndrome, but her symptoms are, are reasonably mild. Uh, and she actually goes to college. Um, so um, we tested the entire family for um, the uh, uh, mycotoxins on the urine assay. You can see for um, ochratoxin A, they range from uh, 2.3 to 6.6. And then the trichothecenes, they were all aflatoxin negative, uh, and they range from 0.13 to 0.59 uh, for the trichothecenes. So when all this came up, uh, the dad, who's a very, very bright guy, said, uh, you know, there must be something wrong with our house, that we don't know what's wrong with our house. So in 2012, all stimulated by the urine mycotoxin assay, they, we had their home or he had their home tested. Now the first thing they did is just a routine air sampling. They, they contacted a company that does the standard air sampling. They came out and they did find actually that Aspergillus penicillium, which as you know on the air sampling, they usually group those together because they can't apparently tell those spores apart, uh, were, uh, were high in one area of the home compared to the outdoor air. Uh, and in the, uh, the uh, mold testing uh, gentleman did indicate that he thought there was a problem and there, that they actually may have a problem with indoor dampness. Um, uh, by this time, the uh, dad, we had exchanged a number of emails and so forth, and he was well aware of the uh, ERMI test. Uh, he's done three ERMIs on the home, uh, separated in time by probably about five or six months. Um, and uh, the Ermes, uh, all of them revealed Aspergillus, various species of Aspergillus penicillium, Stachybotrys, and Catomium. Um, the index, which I agree with the other speakers, I don't really pay attention to. I really want to know what the species are. But the index, curiously, was quite high. His highest one was 16, which is an extraordinarily high Ermi index. Um, uh, and then, interestingly, uh, we sent, uh, oh, by the way, this was, uh, uh, this was dust. Uh, I had told him about the under the refrigerator, but he actually thought a better area is they have some hanging cabinets in their uh, kitchen and dust collects up there. So he went up there and uh, retrieved dust from cabinets that were hanging and uh, I think also down in the uh, air handling system on the, uh, in the basement. I, I told him, I tell all my patients I want old dust. I want dust that's been there for a while because that gives me a history of the home. And uh, so then we took the same dust uh, and he split it up and sent it to real-time laboratories for mycotoxin testing and indeed we showed trichothecenes and lesser low levels of ochratoxin. So we found the toxin producing uh, mole species in their home uh, and we found the actual toxins in the dust from their home. We have four patients uh, of varying degrees of illness with chronic fatigue syndrome and all four of them uh, have, det have um, uh, uh, either uh, trichothecene, ochratoxin, or both uh, in their urine uh, specimens. Okay, so the other thing that, we, that we've been discussing is, uh, which I know is everybody in this room keeps asking the same question, is how do, how do, what is the pathway that makes these people sick? So if this is a, a very clear-cut feature in chronic fatigue syndrome, how does it make them sick? And of course, we have all of these different systems involved, but we decided, and this is uh, uh, largely, um, uh, I've talked with Dr. Thrasher a lot on this, and, and uh, so this is largely stimulated a lot by Dr. Thrasher, is that uh, we decided to, to take a really in-depth look at the mitochondrial situation. Part of this was, was because, and actually I'm the one that told Dr. Thrasher that there was extensive data 
in chronic fatigue syndrome about mitochondria. He knew about all the mitochondria data with, uh, uh, with mycotoxins, and so we have attempted to at least marry this together and see what we came up with. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to bore you with uh, mitochondrial physiology because I don't know it that well, uh, but this is a, a, a mitochondria. Basically, we have the outer membrane and the inner membranes. Um, uh, interestingly, all of these membranes are, are virtually all lipid. These are fatty acids, which is intriguing. Um, the inner membrane is incredibly important because that's where ATP is generated. Uh, so this little cartoon essentially, uh, uh, simplistically, tells you what happens to the mitochondria out in the cytoplasm. Uh, so for every molecule of glucose, one can generate 36 ATP molecules. Uh, you get two ATPs uh, from anaerobic glycolysis out in the uh, cytoplasm, uh, which is called substrate level phosphorylation in the cytoplasm, and this is where lactic acid is generated. And then uh, you uh, can enter then into the Krebs cycle within the mitochondria cristae, um, and one gets two ATPs generated from there. But uh, the real money load is the electron transport chain, uh, in which we, what, as you all know, is called oxidative phosphorylation, in which uh, oxygen is the final uh, receptor or final um, uh, recipient uh, for hydrogen and we generate 32 ATPs uh, here, uh, and that's all occurs along the uh, inner membrane. Okay, so firstly, what, um, what's the chronic fatigue syndrome literature say about mitochondria? So these are all from published studies in the chronic fatigue syndrome literature. These have been, these have been published over probably the last decade or so. There is clearly impaired oxidative phosphorylation. There are re reduced ATP stores. There's impaired recycling of ADP to ATP. Therefore, they have to depend more heavily on glycolysis. Um, increased lactic acid with exercise. Um, reduced oxidative muscle metabolism. Mitochondrial DNA deletions. Mitochondrial degeneration on muscle biopsies. Increased generation of free radicals and diminished carnitine levels. Uh, there's also uh, a paper that shows diminished CoQ10 levels. Um, the, uh, uh, so it clearly looks like that, that uh, sick mitochondria are some, in some way, shape, or form uh, involved with chronic fatigue syndrome. And of course, what's the primary symptom? Fatigue. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, it's in your handout. Uh, this is um, uh, Dr. Thrasher combed through the literature and looked at the mitochondrial, um, uh, the poisonous effects on mitochondria that are, occur with each of the, uh, the, tox the mycotoxins. He looked at aflatoxin, trichothecenes, and ochratoxin A. I've kind of summarized that down for you on this slide. Um, as has already been mentioned today, um, the uh, mycotoxins form DNA adducts. Um, and with mitochondrial DNA, alters the synthesis of mitochondrial proteins. This is probably particularly an issue with the trichothecenes. Uh, disrupts and alters the function of mitochondrial membranes. This may be a huge issue because remember how important those inner membranes are because that's where the electron transport chain um, uh, operates and generates 32 of those 36 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. Um, and that's here, alters the electron transport chain, uh, induces oxidative stress, which leads to mitochondrial damage. Uh, probably involved in this is depletion of the antioxidants, and, and uh, as Dr. Guilford will talk about later, with glutathione and so forth, and induces apoptosis. So the mycotoxins do a lot of bad things to mitochondria, and people with chronic fatigue syndrome seem to have sick mitochondria. So this led us to think maybe that this is a lot more global than we had thought in that you have mitochondria in every cell in your body except the human red blood cell. Every other cell has mitochondria. So this could indeed affect any organ system uh, throughout the body. Now the other thing that, that has puzzled me for years uh, is, and this was discussed already today, that's why I said the other speakers laid a nice groundwork, is uh, 
as Dr. Mon said, there's a, there's a dose relationship, but there's also a dose-host relationship. So is there a heritable or genetic component uh, to susceptibility here? Um, so the, the symptoms and clinical features of chronic fatigue, f fatigue syndrome have similarities and overlap with mitochondri genetic mitochondrial disorders, and I'll show you that on the next couple of slides. Uh, and then familial studies have shown an association with mitochondrial DNA polymorphisms, particularly along the maternal linkage, with functional disorders. Okay. Now, this is some interesting work uh, that I stumbled into about uh, uh, two years ago uh, uh, from Dr. Richard Bowles. Dr. Bowles is a uh, pediatric geneticist at Los, Angel Los Angeles Children's Hospital, and he runs the mitochondrial disorders clinic at Los, An Los Angeles Children's. And uh, he has this very nice online presentation where he presents data that they've looked at with functional disorders. And uh, these are some, not all, of the functional disorders that he's talking about. Chronic fatigue syndrome, chronic anxiety, depression, fibromyalgia, migraine, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, the other term for that that you may recognize is reflex sympathetic dystrophy, cyclical vomiting syndrome, and exercise intolerance. And so um, uh, what Dr. Bowles and his group have, have known for years is that children who are born with definite, proven mitochondrial DNA mutations or polymorphisms often have some of these features. Uh, it's, it's very con not, not uncommon for them to have complex regional pain syndrome, cyclovomin syndrome, they're fatigued, they have exercise intolerance, uh, sometimes they have behavioral abnormalities, uh, chronic pain, etc. So they did an a interesting family study where uh, they looked at maternal inheritance uh, in uh, these children's relatives and then a control group. Now, uh, for those of, I think probably everybody knows this, but just to make sure we're all on the same um, <coughs> wavelength here, is that, that there are two sets of DNA in every cell except a red blood cell, which doesn't have mitochondria, and that is there's the nuclear DNA and then the mitochondrial DNA. This is a very small amount of DNA, but it, it, it uh, encodes for some very important uh, mitochondrial proteins and so forth um, uh, that are essential for mitochondrial function. So the mitochondrial DNA is small in amount, uh, but it's extremely important. The mitochondrial DNA all comes from the mother. So it is passed through the egg, and therefore with, with, um, it'll all be maternal inheritance. I tell my patients, the male children can have the, just as many problems as the female children. They receive the DNA, they just cannot pass it on. So uh, Bowles and his group studied, a, they, they termed one group the mitochondrial group and the other the control group. So they, they started with children who had a known uh, mitochondrial DNA polymorphism, maternally inherited. So they took uh, 18 of their mothers and seven maternal aunts of these children with, known, with a known maternally inherited uh, mitochondrial disorder. Then they took a control group, which were five paternal aunts, five aunts-in-law of these same children as here. Okay, so these are the father's sisters and uh, the, the uh, women that they married, and, uh, or the, the, their aunts-in-law. Then they took 18 mothers of children with autosomal recessive metabolic disorders. So this is, is a different metabolic disorder, but is not uh, maternally uh, inherited. And then 75 mothers of, of um, uh, healthy high school students. And that was the control group. The, the data is incredible. I don't think I've ever seen odds ratios quite like this. So uh, for chronic fatigue syndrome in the mitochondrial group, 19 to 25 had these women who had, uh, uh, who were uh, shared maternal inheritance had, chronic, had a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. Migraine was about as high at 72%, irritable bowel syndrome was 52%, and depression was um, uh, 48%. The control group, as you can see here, is much lower with these phenomenal odds ratios. Chronic fatigue syndrome, 100, odds ratio of 120. I mean, you saw some odds ratio this, this morning that were impressive of 1.75. This is an odds ratio of 120. Even the lowest one, which is depression, 6.1. So 
Bowles and his group have, have at least thrown out there that, that uh, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction may be related, uh, abnormal ATP generation and mitochondrial dysfunction may be related to some of these chronic functional syndromes that, uh, uh, that uh, he and, and others had been looking at. Uh, and there may be a ma maternal inheritance pattern. Okay, so what we know then about chronic fatigue syndrome, mitochondria, and mycotoxins, first of all, the facts. Chronic fatigue syndrome seems to be clearly associated with mitochondrial dysfunction and diminished ATP production. Mycotoxins, virtually all of them that have been looked at, are toxic to mitochondria by many different mechanisms. And there may be a genetic predisposition to mitochondrial dysfunction in uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Therefore, the hypothesis that we bridged together was that mycotoxin exposure may lead to chronic fatigue syndrome via an induction of mitochondrial dysfunction, and that it may be more pronounced in a genetically predisposed individual. Now, a lot has been said today about genetics, and I'm not even remotely saying that mitochondria is the only genetic issue involved. There's clearly all kinds of detox mechanisms. There's Dr. Shoemaker's work with the HLA testing, et cetera. So, uh, but I do think that, that there is a genetic component and uh, one of the genetic components may actually be um, did you inherit um, um, <clears throat> a defective uh, mitochondrial DNA polymorphism. Now these can be inherited through the father's side as well, but that's in the nuclear DNA. So the nuclear DNA encodes for I think it's about 85 percent of the uh, mitochondrial structural proteins and so forth. So uh, it can come, and I actually have one patient where it fits very well with her father's side of the family and her mother's side of the family doesn't fit at all. But uh, Bowles and his group say that about 75 percent of the time these functional disorders in which they've studied, and they've studied uh, pro uh, probably 30 or 40 of these families, uh, these functional disorders send to, tend to uh, about 75 to 80 percent of the time track with uh, uh, the maternal uh, inheritance. So uh, we were studying all of this and then, uh, and then this family came along. So this, this is an interesting little twist that I think raises some very interesting consideration. So this is what I call the simultaneous exposure family. So they get this, again, these are their current ages. We have a father age 57, a mother age 57, and a daughter age 28. Um, they move, and I've just seen, this all occurred since about October. So this is all uh, new data. These were not people that were in the study. Uh, they moved into a brand new home uh, in 2003. I have that underlined for a reason. Um, and within a day or two of moving into the home, the mother said there's a smell in the house. I, don't, I, I can't identify what it is, but there's some smell in here. And the father said, you're crazy, I don't smell anything. There's, I, I don't think there's anything in here. And so the mother kept saying, no, I think there's a smell in here, and it seems to be most prominent on a lower level. They had a walkout uh, basement, and, uh, and it was especially uh, most prominent to the mother's nose in the area of the, of the daughter's bedroom. So the daughter was a senior in high school in 2003, and uh, they moved in about this time of year. She lived there for eight months, and then in the uh, late summer, early fall, left for college. So she was there for eight months. So after the daughter had left for college, then there were just the mom and the dad living there, so the mother keeps investigating this, and she is absolutely convinced that the smell is coming from her daughter's bedroom closet. So one day when she was home alone and no one else was there, she herself cut a hole in the wall of her daughter's bedroom closet in their brand new home. And it was full of, quote, black mold. Now, the first thing they did was call the builder. And the builder had gone bankrupt and was out of business. So she and her husband dis discussed it and they decided they'd take care of this themselves. So they did self-remediation. So they actually tore the wall out and uh, cleaned it up themselves. I don't recall if they, if, I can't recall if she told me if they wore masks or not. Uh, what they found is, is that on the other side of the wall, behind the wall, was a bathroom. And the plumber had not sealed one of the pipes properly, uh, uh, one of the uh, pipes that went to the sink. And uh, so it had been leaking the whole time after he had plumbed that bathroom.
And then, of course, the walls were closed in, and so then it was trapped behind that wall. And so that the smell the mother was, was detecting was probably this mold. Um, and now remember, no testing was done. They did all of this themselves, okay? But here's what happens. Okay, so the mother develops chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia in 2004. Remember, they moved into this house in 2003. So the mom develops chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia, diagnosed. Um, uh, she actually meets the Fukuda criteria in 2004, and that was within about six months after they had discovered and remediated the mold. Okay? The daughter has gone off to college, but while in college, she starts developing chronic health problems. She's perfectly healthy before she went to college. She developed migraine, sinus problems, fatigue, insomnia, and GI problems. Now, she's never officially been diagnosed with anything because she actually lives down here in Texas now. She's married and lives in Texas. The father feels fine. He has no symptoms whatsoever. Okay? Here was their urine testing. All right? So you can see we found uh, the daughter actually had um, aflatoxin, and she had trichothecenes, and the... Uh, uh, some ochratoxin, but uh, below the uh, positive level. Uh, the mother was similar to the daughter. But look who had the highest amount. It was actually the dad. He had ochratoxin at 5.6 and trichothecenes at 0.9. But he feels fine. Absolutely, you can't. And, and the, he and the daughter came in together. And then I corroborated the story with the mother, and I said, does he actually? I mean, she says, no, he feels fine. He, uh, he works 50, 60 hours a week, and... He's in some kind of uh, sales, I think, and she said he, he never complains of anything. Um, so um, uh, these people were obviously within the span of about 10 months uh, were all exposed to the same mold in the same location of the house. The mother and father cleaned it out and remediated it, and the daughter, daughter slept in that bedroom for uh, eight months. And so uh, one would assume there, were pro there was probably ochratoxin producer and a trichothecene producer, presumably stachybotrys was the black mold that they saw. The, um, um, but of course the question is, how come mom and daughter are sick and dad is not? There must be a genetic feature. Is it mitochondrial? Well, this would maybe suggest that because of the maternal inheritance, but uh, there, there clearly is some, appears to be some genetic feature here. Now, the other problem is, this is a huge problem. I, I've said this is one of the hardest ones I've come across. What do I do with the dad? I mean, I've had this, I've had this uh, uh, adage a long time, you can't make a well person better. And so what do I do with them? But he's got these bad levels here. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable, so I'm actually, we're, we're treating him too. Um, uh, but it's, uh, uh, so I, 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 because who knows, later on he could develop cancer or, or some other permutation, so I, I don't feel at all comfortable just ignoring these. Um, which brings up the, then the other question that the, uh, in, in my exposure histories where I have, because remember, I'm going about this backward. I'm starting with people who, who come in and say, I'm sick. And then you say, well, how's your husband or whatever? Well, they're fine. And, but should we be testing them if they were exposed to the same environment? Probably yes, and uh, maybe even managing them if they're asymptomatic. Okay, so um, uh, I am by no means an expert on treatment. There are people in this room who've had much more experience with treatment than I have because I'm a newcomer to this. So, but um, um, I've tried to think this through logically, looked at the literature, uh, some of which have been written by people in this room, uh, and tried to put together some, some concepts. Um, and some of this is basically pretty similar to what you've already heard multiple times today. Like I said, other people laid a nice uh, foundation for me. So this is what I call my input-output model. What I tell my patients is, in a perfect world, I'd like your urine toxin assay to go zero, 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 and to stay zero, zero, zero. That would be a perfect world. Um, and that, that basically the toxins have been cleared uh, and you don't have to deal with them anymore. Uh, so uh, 
I talk about the input of, uh, so this is at the time we do the test. At the time we do the test, the input of toxins into the body and the output of the toxins out of the body. Um, this has been discussed multiple times and I would agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said today. You ha if, if, because remember some of my patients were exposed 15, 20 years ago and live in a brand new house and they don't seem to have a current problem. So uh, I tell my patients, if it applies to you at the current time, uh, uh, if there's any question at all, um, um, I have them get their homes tested, which is a whole other area of that's incredibly uh, been frustrating and confusing because the whole story with the spores really don't help you that much. And, and some of them have done ERMI, some of them we've had to send down to uh, uh, Dr. Hooper's lab for uh, uh, environmental mycotoxin testing. Um, but clearly, they must be removed from the exposure. I think everybody would agree on that. Um, this one I'm going to spend a little bit more time on uh, in the next couple of slides, and that is, could these people be internally, and this is a new concept, okay, and I don't, I don't know if I'm right on this one or not. Uh, there are a lot of people here that are smarter about uh, toxic mold than I am, but is it possible that these people actually have internal mold spores or fragments that are actually releasing toxins? So in other words, we've had this concept all along that they actually breathe in the toxins and they have these chemicals inside of them. But what about the, what about the mold? What about the Mayo study that Dr. Gray talked about where they, where they have all these different species of mold in their, in their sinuses? Well, what if one of those is an Aspergillus fumigatus or an As Aspergillus uh, acreus or one of those that produces ochratoxin or aflatoxin? So could one actually have ongoing toxin production inside the body? I don't know, but I'm suspicious. The output then is, is trying to get the toxins out of the body. Um, I tell my patients, we know of two ways they leave the body, the urine, which through the kidneys and the urine, which is obviously the nature of the test, and then the liver and the bile, which I'll spend a, a little bit more time on. Uh, that's already been discussed. And then some of the toxins may come out through sweat. Okay. Um, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with what was said at lunch about the toxin sequestrants or the toxin binders. I think that's probably critical. Um, I didn't address that as much early on. I think that was a mistake on my part. Uh, and it's because of uh, enterohepatic recirculation and reabsorption. This is an interesting study that was published uh, by Pace et al. Uh, back in 1985. Now these next two studies are, were done by the Department of Defense. This were done at, uh, in Fort Dedrick, Maryland by the Department of Defense, uh, basically looking at uh, biological warfare exposure. Uh, and the one that's been studied most is the T2 trichothecene um, for biological warfare study and experiments and apparently in studies uh, I mean, uh, apparently where it has been suspicioned or proven that, bio that mycotoxins were used for biological warfare, it is suspected that T2 was the agent that was used. Um, so this is a study of guinea pigs that were injected uh, with a half a uh, milliliter per kilogram of radioactive, radioactive labeled um, uh, T2 trichothecene so they could track it and they could also track the metabolites. And they were studying the distribution excretion of these uh, metabolites. Uh, what they found is that clearly the liver was the major organ for metabolism and detoxification, that bile plays a major role in the elimination of T2 metabolites. Uh, and interesting in this study is that the, that the major things that were excreted were not T2 itself, they were metabolites. There were a bunch of different metabolites. And in fact, these authors uh, suggested that these metabolites uh, were retained in the guinea pig for very long periods of time. So if you think about it, if we do a... a urine mycotoxin assay and we get trichothecenes, well that's just the parent agent. There could be all kinds of metabolites that we're not measuring that they have internally. And these metabolites may have uh, toxicity. Uh, and these authors did indicate that in their paper. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> and that they clearly sh uh, indicated, re now this is why I underlined injected. Okay, this was not given orally, this was injected. So that clearly shows that there is, that the bile and fecal levels indicate that T2 and its metabolites undergo enterohepatic recirculation and reabsorption. So basically, as I tell my patients, they just go in a loop. Uh, 
and uh, that the urine is the other major source for elimination uh, in their study. I don't know if guinea pigs sweat, so I don't think they could study that. Um, now, this is a study by a, uh, another group at, uh, uh, in Fort Dedrick, Maryland with the Department of Defense. And this was looking at um, uh, could you alter this enterohepatic recirculation with activated charcoal. Um, so they basically uh, took mice on this occasion rather than guinea pigs. And they administered them T2 toxin either orally or subcutaneously, and then they simply measured the survival. So this is sort of an uh, LD50 study. Um, and they uh, used uh, activated charcoal by Gavage, um, and this was given, um, they actually did a couple of different time points. I'll show you the ones where they gave the activated charcoal at the same time that they, uh, that they gave the toxin, whether it was either by oral or subcutaneously. So. The, um, in the, uh, when T2 was administered orally, the activated charcoal uh, completely protected against the lethal effects, and with the parental T2, it significantly improved, and I'll show you the data on the next slide. So um, this is basically uh, directly from their paper, is that th this suggests that enteropatic recirculation of T2 um, uh, does occur, and that activated charcoal short circuits uh, the enterohepatic cycle, so that the binders or the sequestrants that have already been discussed today clearly in this model uh, seem to work. And I thought that was interesting. This was activated charcoal with a trichothecene. Uh, now, here's the actual data from the paper. Um, they took, um, uh, this is the oral group that got the uh, trichothecene orally uh, and then got activated charcoal at the same time. Uh, there's a 100% survival uh, if they got the charcoal. If they got a saline uh, control, only 6% of the animals survived. Uh, and in the subcutaneous trichothecene, if they got activated charcoal, 90% uh, of the animals survived. Uh, it wasn't quite, it, subcutaneous wasn't as bad as oral uh, because 50% uh, uh, um, still survived with the saline. Um, so the other, uh, so we've, we've talked about these, the mycotoxin binders or sequestrants. Um, uh, some people have uh, clearly used uh, far infrared saunas and so forth to try to uh, increase sweat output. And then you'll hear a lot about this later, uh, increasing de detoxification, correcting the um, uh, oxidant, antioxidant balance with glutathione, IV vitamin C, et cetera. Um, um, and then, of course, we've already talked about eliminating exposure. But this is the one that I don't know what to do with. And that is, are there internal mole spores that we need to treat with antifungal agents? And I don't know the answer to that. But it's interesting. So the first question is, are there internal mole spores? Dennis told me at one point, he says, no, I don't think there are. And I said, well, Dennis, you showed it. You, 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 you all had a, a, a paper. That, uh, it's a poster, actually, that showed it. So uh, here's the poster presentation, and here's the, the paper. And that fungal DNA was detected in lung, liver, skin, brain, and sputum, various different species, including stachybotrys. This is DNA. And mycotoxins, obviously, have been found, as Dennis talked about earlier, in many different tissues and fluids, with urine seem to be the uh, key. And they found all three of the, um, of the toxins. So uh, is there a role for antifungals? Again, I don't know. But uh, since I am an infectious disease specialist, I'll give you um, a little, just a very, very brief discussion of antifungals. The mycotoxin binders have already been uh, discussed. Um, like I said, I have less experience with those than other people in the room. Uh, I guess I did not put bentonite on here. Uh, that was an uh, oversight when I made the slide. OK, so the antifungals now. Um, my patients come and they say, well, you know, I ought to be in good shape, doc, because I took Diflucan. I took fluconazole, so that, that should protect me, right? And I go, no, it's worthless. Fluconazole has absolutely no activity whatsoever against the moles, nor does nystatin. They don't work. They are yeast. Now, if you want to treat yeast, candida, they're okay. We use fluconazole to treat cryptococcal meningitis. We use fluconazole to treat coccidioidomycosis meningitis. We use them for those things. But... They don't work for the higher moles, the higher fungi. Uh, 
the triazoles, which is itraconazole, voriconazole, and this newer one, posiconazole, um, are, all probably do ha have activity. These are the, our uh, current lung transplant who has pulmonary aspergillosis, is actually on mycofungin, and then when he comes off of mycofungin, we may switch him to voriconazole. Um, these are all very active against uh, uh, aspergillus. Uh, there's some in vitro data that they're active against penicillium. Uh, Stachybotrys has basically not been studied. There is one paper that suggests maybe voriconazole has activity against one strain of Stachybotrys, but uh, because uh, Stachybotrys has not been reported to cause invasive infection, these never get studied for Stachybotrys. So Stachybotrys is simply a guess. Um, by the way, these work by all of these, these triazoles work by uh, inhibiting the conversion of lanosterol to ergosterol in the cell membrane. So that's the mechanism by which they work. Um, the okinacandins, there are basically two largely in use right now, mycofungin and caspofungin. We usually have used mycofungin. Um, these, are, these have some disadvantages. They're IV only. They're expensive. Uh, so you have to put in a PIC line and give them IV. Um, they've been relegated largely to the immunocompromised host with uh, invasive disseminated fungal infections. They are very safe. They have very few side effects. They work by uh, inhibiting 1,3-beta-D-glucan synthase. So they impair the synthesis of beta-D-glucan beta in the cell wall. And uh, so for the moles and fungi that have ample amounts of beta-D-glucan, they should be effective. Uh, they do not work for rhizobus or mucor because they don't have uh, beta-D-glucan. Um, it is curious that uh, I have treated some people now with that, that, and that. I've not used this one yet because it's kind of a hard one to use. These drugs have side effects. They're expensive. Uh, they're difficult to use. It's not as hard for me because I've been using them for uh, 20 years. So uh, we use these things almost daily in other types of patients that we see. But it was a little bit of a stretch, should we try this in, in um, um, uh, patients with um, uh, mycotoxin illness with a positive urine assay. And I must admit, we have seen some results. Uh, we have seen people. I have had uh, one patient who got completely well with three weeks of oriconazole. Completely well. Ten years of symptoms just melted away. Now, I'm, all I'm doing, I get, all I did was give her, I didn't even give her a sequesterant or a binder. All I gave her was voriconazole. So it, it again raises this question of are there, is there internal mold? I don't know, but it is uh, at least interesting for discussion purposes. Thank you.